Hello, everyone. Welcome to Space Ventures' first campaign closing live stream. My name is Jivika Rajani. I'm the operations manager at Space Ventures, and I am broadcasting live to you today from Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. I'd love to hear where you all are tuning in from. Uh, so drop that into the comments, and I'll give you a shout out if I see uh, see some of that. So if you're new to Space Ventures, if you're new to our live streams, we've done just one other of these before. It worked so well that now we're doing uh, a couple more. So this one is gonna be really exciting. But if you do not know the protocol, just a quick things for housekeeping, make sure that you're logged in on your Space Ventures account. That way, once you're logged in to YouTube uh, on a channel, you'll be able to participate in the chat. So Jose is joining us from Fort Lauderdale, amazing. I would love to know where you guys are joining in from. So try that now. Our wonderful Space Ventures team is going to be putting instructions in the chat. Again, you got to be logged into Space Ventures. You have to be logged into YouTube and then you can participate. And today is going to be a lot, a lot of participation focused because we are going to be going live to Tulsa, Oklahoma we're gonna be doing a live factory tour with Infinite Composites, the campaign that is our focus today. And we're also going to be uh, blowing up a pressure vessel. <laughs> um, we had a couple of questions come in when we sent out the registration link for this. So I'll be uh, bringing those up as well. And if you have any questions throughout this, uh, this live stream, put them in the chat as well. We'll be pulling from those too. One of the great questions that I'm looking forward to uh, uh, having Michael Tate and Matt Villarreal from IC answer is, why the heck are you blowing up a tank? Uh, it's a great question and we have a good answer. So Julie, thank you for tuning in from Tucson. Um, Alex, West, Cro West Coast crew represent. Nice to see you. Starbase Texas in the house. Walter from Charlotte, welcome. So good to see you. Again, uh, we're going to be doing lots and lots of interactions, so make sure you can comment, all right? Space Park from LA, all right, I'll be back in a couple of weeks and maybe we can meet up then, who knows? <laughs> all right, so let's, um, for those who are unfamiliar with Infinite Composites and what they do, we're going to roll a quick video to just get you in the mood for what we have planned, and then right after that, I'll introduce Matt and Tate from the team, and then we'll just kick this thing off. So let's roll our wonderful video. From racing to rockets and so much more, Infinite Composites is building critical hardware to advance society as we know it. Invest in Infinite Composites and invest in your future. Oh gosh, that video, am I right? <laughs> Matt and uh, Tate, let's uh, let's bring you guys on. Hey, Jim, how's it going? It's going hey, good. Hey, everybody. Oh, hey, everybody. Matt Villarreal here, founder and CEO of Infinite Composites. Welcome to beautiful Tulsa and our uh, world headquarters. Tate, where are you at? I'm calling in from uh, Denver, Colorado. I was out here doing some uh, customer visits today. So uh, unfortunately, I don't get to be live with you guys at the shop, but I will be commenting and uh, providing insight from afar. Wonderful. So we're going to go into the tour in just a moment. I know I was tracking the comments on social media before this. Lots of people really want to see what a pressure vessel factory looks like, myself included. I'm really excited to get to it. Uh, before we do that, why don't you give us the what a how many every second elevator pitch just for those who are maybe not as familiar with what it is that you do? Yeah, so if you guys don't know, uh, Infinite Composites designs, develops, and manufactures ultra lightweight gas storage systems, uh, primarily for use in space, aviation, transportation, and infrastructure applications. Our value is that we've eliminated the need for a metal or plastic liner leaving behind only an optimized carbon fiber structure 
which saves mass, saves cost, and it saves lead time versus uh, state-of-the-art propellant tanks. Um, so uh, we're able to do this because we leverage additive manufacturing processes and nanoscale materials to enhance the capabilities of our tanks and our resin systems. Um, so that's that's a high level overview. Happy to answer any other questions, and uh, we'll uh, pass it off to Michael to give you uh, uh, some additional information. Thanks, Matt, for the uh, description. Uh, yeah. So uh, one of the things that we wanted to uh, provide some insight or background on was the uh, origin and uh, company history. So um, back in 2010, Matt and I. Um, started this company, but prior to that, uh, what led us to um, getting into pressure vessels and really uh, getting hungry for advancing uh, uh, pressure vessels was uh, we were on a collegiate race team, uh, Formula SAE. So for my fellow college uh, people out there who did uh, the race program, we were Formula, uh, Formula SAE uh, group and we converted a vehicle over to uh, compressed natural gas. And that's one of the uh, areas where we discovered the drawbacks uh, some of the existing tank technologies. So we converted a four, quarter scale Formula One car over to uh, compressed natural gas. Um, in that, we uh, discovered that uh, we were using an all metal type one tank. Um, we discovered that, you know, that additional weight on the vehicle threw off the weight of the vehicle. Uh, it didn't store very much fuel for its size. And um, there was just a lot of drawbacks giving us kind of range anxiety in, uh, in the vehicle. And so, um, we started doing research on pressure vessels, uh, came across an article in Composite World magazine that uh, talks about um, how linerless pressure vessels could be the holy grail of uh, pressurized gas storage, uh, leading to uh, space exploration and sustainable transportation. And so uh, when Matt and I discovered that, we experienced the problem ourselves. We decided to uh, start a company focusing on exactly that, advancing uh, space exploration and sustainable transportation through lighter weight, more efficient uh, gas storage tanks. And so um, fast forward, um, we, you know, start with some uh, business plan competitions. We won some research contracts, uh, slowly built up the company to uh, get our first working prototype, uh, raised a small round to move into uh, our current facility um, back in 2015-16. And uh, we were originally focused on compressed natural gas because that was the industry that we understood and knew. But uh, we quickly got pulled into the uh, space arena because of the performance of our tanks. Um, lots of interesting uh, opportunities there. So uh, now we primarily focus on space and uh, aviation and any, there, anything that uh, weight is critical in. So uh, kick it back over to Jiffica or Matt to uh, get things moving along. Yeah, I mean, that's a really cool origin story, right? From racing cars to powering uh, rockets. Very cool. So for those who are just joining us, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you want to definitely head over to the Space Ventures website. And when you go on the IC page, you'll be able to scroll down to the team section. There's a really cool picture of uh, Matt and Tate back in the day in, in the call in during their college days at uh, you know with with the racing crew, um, so lots of good information there. And uh, just on that note, Tate, so you and I have known each other since uh, 2020 when we worked together at TechStars. Um, but of course, you and Matt have known each other way longer. How how long have you guys actually uh, been uh, partners in crime? Uh, so we've known each other since uh, 2001. Um, we really started working together in a collaborative fashion, probably in about 2008 with the, uh, the race team. Um, we were also uh, led the entrepreneurship uh, club at Oklahoma State University as well, and were involved in the various other uh, uh, programs. So we've been working together on, um, I guess, projects and programs since about mid early 2000s and knew each other for a couple of years prior to that. Okay, awesome. Well, you guys haven't killed each other yet, so that's a great sign. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're just about re getting ready to go on to the live tour portion of the stream, which I am raring to go on. Uh, just a couple of notes, because we're going to be on a live factory floor, the Wi-Fi may cut in and out. We're actually lucky that Tate is in Colorado right now, because if that happens, then he'll just fill in the gaps. So if you see the feed kind of cutting in and out, 
we know we're working on it. Hopefully the Wi-Fi gods smile down upon us and we wouldn't have any problems. But just in case we do, just bear with us and we'll still do our best to give you guys a great show. So with that, Matt, I think we're ready to, to bring you back. Hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to Infinite, Infinite Composites World Headquarters. This is the front entryway. See some of our banners. This is uh, one of our lunar lander tanks that we developed for NASA. We'll show you a, uh, another one that's very interesting later. And then the tank that we're going to burst is actually a new version with an upgraded resin system uh, of the same exact tank. So that'll be very exciting. Um, so let's, uh, let's go. Follow me. First stop we'll see, this is Michael and I's office. This is uh, where all the deals are made. This is where we uh, battle it out when we have uh, disagreements. And uh, we also uh, have a couple of drinks and cocktails in here too. But uh, it's, a, it's a great workspace, back to back. Uh, so great environment for collaborating. Keep coming this way. So how many team members do you have um, in the facility, Matt? Yeah, we have uh, 18 team members full time and uh, a few contractors and um, interns. So first stop uh, here, this is our uh, quality assurance office. This is Noom, our quality engineer, and Laura, our quality uh, manager. And uh, they make sure everything goes smoothly, make sure the products go out the door and they have all the right analysis, all the right checks, all the right paperwork, and basically just make sure everything around here works right. So, Hi, thanks, guys. Nice to see some woman power in the space. Yeah. So uh, next stop, this is our engineering office. There's a lot of people out and out and about in the shop. We got a lot of deliveries going on, so uh, some of the desks are empty. But uh, before we keep going, uh, I want to show you this uh, really interesting tank and. Uh, uh, let you know what's uh, going on with it. So I have with me um, Shamim Mandal. Uh, he's going to tell you a little bit more about this uh, tank right here. Thank you, Matt. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Shamim, and I'm the materials engineer here at Infinite Composites. And so this pressure, composite pressure vessel was specifically designed for storing fluids in cryogenic conditions. We, de we developed this for NASA as part of their subscale lunar lander propellant tank. It can store liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, liquid methane, and others. We have tested it down to negative 340 Fahrenheit, and it has gone through, uh, successfully gone through multiple cryogenic thermal cycle tests. And what's awesome about this tank is that it was tested at the same NASA test facility where they tested the flight hardware for the Apollo moon mission. I think that's pretty cool. Back to you, Matt. Yeah, that's great. Uh, just one thing to add on here. There's some really cool sensors and technology that were installed when we were doing the testing. So um, these uh, sensors right here are PZT sensors. Big shout out to Kennedy Space Center for uh, installing these. These actually are called mass propellant gauges, and they can tell you how much fuel is in your tank in zero gravity. So when this liquid's floating around in a giant ball inside of here, it sends vibrations through and then it reads those vibrations and tells you how much mass is in there. Um, another cool technology on this, uh, we'll turn it around here. Uh, we use some uh, what's called digital image correlation. So you can see there's a bunch of targets on here. There's this uh, very interesting uh, pattern uh, on the tank and that basically allows us to do measurements of the tank just via video. So we can just focus in on here and we test the tank and it'll tell us how much the tank's stretching and what directions, how much strain is on it. And uh, you can actually get a 3D model and show you basically uh, how the tank is oscillating when it's uh, pressurized. So wow. very so cool stuff. It's almost like, uh, you know, the dots you see on the, the after spaces when they're doing the CGI. Is that, is that- Yeah, very, very much like a, a motion capture uh, type of uh, application, uh, but way awesome. more precise. Cool. So while we're in the engineering office, Chris in our comments has a question. So he's asking how many engineers are on the team and what are their engineering specialities? Um, yeah, we have uh, 
seven engineers uh, full time right now and two interns. Uh, the vast majority of our uh, engineering team is uh, mechanical or aerospace engineers. Uh, we do have two electrical engineering interns uh, as well. And uh, although uh, Shamim's a mechanical and aerospace engineer, his uh, master's thesis was on uh, graphene nanocomposites, and uh, he did a lot of study on uh, material science. So uh, we do also have a couple of master's in material science candidates on our team who are working towards their uh, master's in material science degree. Awesome. Okay. Let's keep All moving. All right. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Shamim. Uh, we'll see you in a little bit. Let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the next stop. Again, for those of us who's just who are just joining, we're just going through the engineering room right now. Oh, look at that tank <laughs> counterweight. <laughs> yeah, we uh, use that to keep that door closed, and it's uh, you know we find use cases for uh, spare tanks all the time. <laughs> I bet. All right, everybody, this is the main shop floor. Sorry, it's loud. There's a lot going on. We got the multiple different uh, projects that we're delivering tanks on, trying to get them ready to ship out today. Um, so you got a hydrogen uh, aircraft tank uh, over here on the ground that's uh, getting ready to be tested. We got two spacecraft propellant tanks here. Uh, these are about to go out for some uh, testing as well. One's going to do vibe shock and load testing. The other tank is going to uh, thermocycling tests uh, to simulate orbiting the Earth uh, thousands of times. Uh, so these will be really cool. Uh, when we uh, get these up and uh, these should be launching uh, within the next 12 months, at least, uh, hopefully in the next nine. Um, so nice. I'll show you one more tank over here. This is another interesting tank. Uh, this is another cryo tank that we made for NASA and Kennedy Space Center. As you can see, it's a different shape. So spherical tanks have different, uh, different advantages and disadvantages, uh, but uh, this was a, a really cool project. Uh, we got to deliver four of these to Kennedy Space Center, and uh, we uh, tested it with the same fluids, uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, can handle liquid methane and liquid oxygen as well. So, so all cool. right, we'll keep, we'll keep moving on to the next uh, part of the tour. Uh, it's so, going to get a little, it's going to get a little loud back here. We're going to go see the oven and uh, it makes a lot of noise. There's some parts in it. So bear with me. Okay. Tate, while uh, Matt's walking over, I think we just cut out when he was talking about the types of testing going on in that room. The first one was that vibration testing he mentioned. Yeah, vibration shock and load testing. So that's to simulate the environment that the uh, tank will see during launch and uh, uh, into orbit. And then the, uh, like he said, the thermal cycle testing is to uh, simulate uh, the cycle around the earth as the uh, vehicle is uh, orbiting. And uh, in that particular case, it's a bus letting out other satellites. So um you know it'll be up there for a while taking multiple circles getting radiation and other uh, temperature exposures uh, along the way so cool. back map all right am i in my back great yes. uh so next stop is our, our uh, industrial scale oven um as i mentioned it's uh, it's got some parts in it right now so we'll show a picture of what's on the inside afterwards but this thing uh can go up to 500 degrees fahrenheit it consumes about 600,000 BTUs of uh, natural gas per hour. It's got uh, four channels of uh, thermocouples, so we can uh, test different loads. Make sure all the tanks and uh, let the program run overnight, and then it'll complete uh, when it's done. All right. So we warned you about the Wi-Fi, Matt. Can you just repeat right. that last bit again, please? Just uh, repeat the thermal sec uh, thermal conductors and uh, information about post that. Maybe I'll take it over. Uh, yeah. So uh, what Matt was saying is that there's a uh, uh, temperature probes in there to uh, uh, read the temperature internal and external to the tank. Uh, we have uh, multiple probes to take both the environmental and the tank temperature so that we can uh, get a good idea of um, where we're curing. And we have a leading lagging thermal conductors. Um, I think you mentioned the, the max temperature was 500 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and we burned about uh, 60,000 BTUs per hour through that thing. Awesome. So we have a question coming in. I think it's super relevant for this this part, as I understand it. So Space Park is asking, do you have internal capability for vibe, vibration, and thermal testing? 
Uh, not currently. Um, you're, you're about to see um, more or less the extent of our uh, testing capabilities right now. Most of our testing is uh, hydrostatic based. Um, we outsource a lot of um, specialty testing such as vibration and um, thermal testing just because uh, the investment in that uh, equipment is pretty high right now, which is why we're raising money, uh, you know, so that we can uh, be able to get additional toys and tools to be able to uh, execute on our job, increase our profit margins and uh, have more control over the uh, testing and uh, process. And I see a new investment has been made. So that's uh, very exciting. I think that's the, the first one of the live streams. So happy to uh, yeah, that, that's a great point. So everyone who's watching live on the Space Ventures website, there's a really cool functionality that we have out right now. So anytime you make a new investment, it doesn't matter if you already have an investment in uh, the company, yeah, right? You can increase your investment, you can decrease your investment. Hopefully you don't do that. But every time there's a change, you will see uh, a little a little spark of joy come up on your screen. So I'll just leave it at that and let you guys figure out what that is for yourself. But it's really cool, and we'd love to you know see see more of that coming in if you're so inclined. Okay, so Matt, I think we as long as soon as the video stabilizes again, then we can move into um, this portion of the tour. Yeah, so since we're waiting on that to uh, stabilize, I'll answer uh, Christian's question about what kind of failures have we seen uh, during the thermal and vibration testing. We actually haven't had any failures during those tests yet. Um, all of them have been successful passes, so that's uh, very exciting for us. Uh, on the uh, vibration side, um, you know, we have a couple of different unique mounting solutions um, to provide to customers to uh, um, be able to mount and hold our tanks. Um, and so we've tested a, a bunch of those all, uh, I think three or four different methods that we've developed have all been successful. So very excited um, about that. And uh, haven't done a ton of thermal testing, but I believe the uh, the one case that we had, we had no uh, known issues. So I've been fairly successful on uh, validating the new technology. That's great. So Matt, you have a more stable Wi-Fi signal. Let's uh, Let's make use of that. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. We were going to give you a little intro to the hydrostatic tester. Um, we'll see more of it later. But uh, basically, our Galiso 15,000 hydro tester can do proof testing, which is uh, basically a validation that every tank goes through to make sure it can handle the pressures that it needs. And uh, then it also does burst testing, which we uh, do. We test the failure, pressurize the tank until it explodes to make sure that the design requirements are met and that we have safe margins on the uh, design. Um, so it's uh, really interesting. Do uh, you want to try and go out and see the uh, blast chamber itself? Yeah, we'll, yes. we'll walk over there and see if we can uh, keep the Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, let's give it a shot. Uh, so just to give a little backstory on, or uh, more information on uh, the testing process, uh, proof testing is basically a test uh, above the expected operating pressure of the tank. So. Uh, for simple numbers, we'll use 1,000 PSI as the maximum expected operating pressure, or MEOP. Um, so your proof test or your test pressure would be roughly 1.25 to 1.5 times your MEOP. So uh, in this 1,000 PSI case, you'd be looking at a 1,250 or 1,500 PSI uh, proof test. And so that's to say, if we're going to operate it here, we're safe at least up to here before any uh, additional issues. So it just gives you some margin. Uh, in the operating condition. And then as Matt said, we'll take it up to burst to validate the uh, design. And that can be anywhere between one and a half to three times uh, the expected operating pressure. And so uh, hopefully we'll get a demonstration of that uh, today if we can get the uh, video footage to uh, cooperate. Right. So, okay. yeah, Matt, I don't know if you know, but uh, we weren't able to actually see any of that uh, out there, but we'll come back <laughs> here. Oh no. <laughs> so, All right, uh, guys. We, we discussed this too. So the other uh, update that uh, we can provide over here um, is, you know, we're about to go in the filament winding room, I believe. So this is where we actually um, process the carbon fiber on the tank. But uh, one of the primary questions we get is, you know, for a linerless design, how do we accomplish that? Because uh, traditionally you have a plastic or metal liner, you wrap that in a uh, carbon composite and that liner serves as both the shape and the gas barrier and it's a permanent uh, structure on the inside. Uh, we've developed a couple of mandrel technologies, two that we primarily use right now, 
Um, one is a more fixed design, one is a more variable design, but basically we have a tooling that uh, we can um, remove out of the tank and reuse, um, and that is our mandrel. That's what actually serves as a shape. Um, the second part of it is the uh, resin system, so that's actually what acts as our uh, permeation barrier, or what stops the gas from uh, escaping from the tank. So instead of relying on a super heavy metal or expensive uh, liner or a uh, traditional plastic liner, uh, we rely on our resin systems, which um, act as our permeation barrier, and then a second resin, barrier, uh, resin system to act as the uh, structural integrity of the carbon fiber. So um, very similar to other tanks, except for the elimination of the liner. Everyone else will go through a very similar process, uh, filament winding, uh, hydrostatic proof test or oven cure usually, or most uh, other groups may use a uh, autoclave. Uh, we're out of autoclave, which reduces costs. Um, and then, you know, your proof tests and any other validation or acceptance testing. So, Got it. Okay, so let's, uh, I think we're just waiting for Matt to find uh, some stability. So I'll just uh, bring up a question that we got previously when we opened up the registration from this. So the question from Chandler is, how are the advancements on the linerless tank going? Are there possibilities of updates to the design with discoveries of better material compositions? Yes, this is a great question. Wish Matt was uh, tuned back in to answer it because he's more of our uh, materials expert and he's also uh, the one who leads a lot of our uh, innovation and our primary uh, patent author. But uh, yes, we are evaluating uh, different, uh, both materials for the, the mandrel technology as well as materials for um, the composite matrix. And so um, we have a couple, like I said, two uh, current mandrel technologies where uh, in the process of developing a third for larger uh, tank sizes. And then uh, we're constantly advancing our resin systems um, for permeation, strength, uh, temperature resistance, both cryo and uh, high temperature, and uh, uh, customizing our resins to uh, store different fluids. So um, that permeation resin uh, that I mentioned earlier, we tailor that and customize it for cryogenic uh, more traditional gases, like maybe your uh, methane, uh, helium, uh, nitrogen, those uh, types of fluids, uh, even xenon and krypton for electric propulsion. And then we have a, a another resin system for um, uh, hazardous materials like high test peroxide. So mm -hmm. um, things that uh, um, composite tanks previously haven't been able to do, we've been able to create uh, material solutions to be able to com combat those uh, environmental mm -hmm. conditions to be able to store uh, fluids that others can. Awesome. Cool. So um, I think we can touch a bit back on the applications of some of those uh, materials and those technologies that you mentioned. I believe we're ready to go back to the tour. So hopefully this time we're here to stay. How's it going, everybody? Can you hear me? Doing good. I can hear you. Great. Great. <laughs> this is the winding room. This is where all the magic happens. This is where uh, all the composites laid down on the, uh, on the tanks. Uh, we got uh, Dallas over here winding a, uh, a uh, pressurant tank for a uh, launch vehicle application right now. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty big machine. You got the fibers over here. These are uh, all carbon fiber spools, so we can handle eight at a time. Uh, comes on these bobbins, so unlike your uh, typical carbon fiber sheets that most people are familiar with, this is one continuous band of carbon fiber that uh, is wrapped around the tank like a spider wrapping its prey. So you can see the fibers going in to the back, going through, and then they go through a resin bath, which picks up resin and places it on the fibers in a controlled manner to be laid on the tank. Very cool. So this is the winding machine itself. Basically operates kind of like a four axis lathe. So you got a spindle rotation, you have a carriage going back and forth, you got a cross carriage going front to back, and then the payout head turned 360 degrees. And that payout head turning is what allows us to make domes on the tanks rather than just uh, straight pipes. So um, this is uh, this tank can, or this machine can make tanks up to 30 inch diameter by 12 feet long, and it has a four meter long bed on it. Wow! So this is how, uh, uh, this is our main piece of equipment. Matt, so how how long does it take? to make the smallest tank that you make, and then where you can give information on what that size is, and also the largest tank that you guys can do here. Um, yeah, so the smallest tank uh, we can make takes 
about 25 to 30 minutes to wind. Um, and the largest one can take up to six or seven hours. Um, so it's a, it's very widely ranging depending on tank size, pressure, and, uh, and many other factors. Got it. So you can, you can churn out quite a few tanks with that one machine. Like how many do you produce per week, per month? Do you have like a fixed number? Um, it's, it's highly dependent on the demand and the size of the tanks that are going through the queue. Um, we're, we're producing, uh, between 10 and 20 tanks, uh, every week. Um, you know, many of those go for testing and other things. Uh, but, uh, we're starting to deliver quite a few more, uh, uh, production deliverables, uh, that are going to go into vehicles. So a lot of heavy testing right now. Awesome. We have another question. Okay. Alex is asking, what's the throwaway rate? Uh, the throwaway rate, we're at about uh, 15% right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that can go wrong in the resin and stuff like that. So, um, we're pretty conservative with, uh, what we, uh, what we scrap. Um, we don't want to send these things out uh, with any flaws or anything like that in them. So, uh, pretty right. try to keep that pretty tight. Um, and some of the future investment that we'll make will help us uh, really rein that in and uh, and get to a very very high uh, um, throughput rate. Okay, awesome. One more question: Has any customer sure. qualified your tanks for space? Uh, we're in the midst of multiple qualification programs right now for our customers. Um, most of the time, the customers will do our own qualification testing here on the component level. We'll deliver those to the customers, and then they'll complete the remaining qualification on a, on a system level or vehicle level. So we've got the multiple vehicle level uh, qualification uh, programs going on right now. Very interesting. So that part where you cut out earlier, I believe you wanted to show us um, some external space. There, I think I saw like a door. Is, is that right? Out to the blast chamber, I think. Yeah, we, we were going to go out to the blast chamber. It's not very pretty on the outside, but we do have live feed on the inside. So we'll uh, we'll swap over to that uh, here in just a few minutes. Okay, awesome. Cool. All right. Great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next part of the, uh, the program. Thanks. I'm trying to remember what part is the next part. <laughs> <laughs> Tate, do you know? Uh, are we doing uh, traction updates? Um, yeah, I think I think let's do it. Let's uh, let's wait for Mac to get us set up in the next space. It's almost like uh, we're you know shooting a movie and he's moving from location to location. So we'll just go with it. Uh, Tate, uh, you're on. <laughs> Great. So uh, yeah, we've had a um, good amount of traction uh, with the the company. We've served over uh, thirty customers so far, uh, including uh, NASA, as Matt mentioned, a couple of. Uh, uh, DOD groups, uh, including Air Force and the uh, the Army. Uh, we've also uh, worked with uh, random groups like Disney, um, providing uh, pressure vessels for some uh, programs for them. But um, what I'm most excited about was some of our uh, current programs. So uh, most of our stuff is in the uh, space and aviation or aerospace uh, markets. Um, our current programs include a, a launch vehicle uh, program, so some high pressure uh, helium tanks. In fact, that's uh, that design, which uh, we use for both uh, launch vehicles and satellites, is what you saw on the, uh, the filament winder. Uh, we also have our largest production order on that size uh, unit at, uh, I believe, 52 units. Um, so we're cranking out quite a bit of those uh, this year. Um, we also have a DARPA LEO satellite uh, program uh, providing electric propulsion tanks. Uh, we have a geo satellite program providing uh, also electric propulsion tanks and helium tanks. Uh, for a geostationary uh, storage. Um, and then we have a uh, LEO uh, satellite bus program where we're providing a uh, oxidizer tank. And then uh, as of Friday last week, um, we received our first uh, lunar lander program uh, for a high pressure helium tank. So very excited about that because we are literally uh, going back to the, uh, going to the moon. So it'd be very exciting to get that, uh, get our products out into, uh, into space, both around earth and beyond. Um, so we're, we're very excited to be kicking that off. We also have a couple of other uh, lunar lander bids out there. So um, lots of opportunities in space right now. And then um, on the aviation side, uh, we've got uh, two experimental aircraft programs, both running uh, uh, hydrogen on those, a unmanned aerial vehicle or a UAV 
also running a, a hydrogen tank and then a hypersonic vehicle program. Uh, running a, a high-pressure helium tank, um, both a large one, and then uh, we just got some orders for another uh, tanks for that uh, project. I don't know the details of what they're being used for at this point, but um, uh, expanding on that hypersonic uh, program as well. So uh, very exciting stuff going on right now. This is you know what gets me out of bed every day and uh, in the office and even out here at Denver to, uh, to try to get some of these new deals because our ultimate goal is widespread adoption of uh, linerless technology. So we're trying to get in as many verticals as possible. And you can see um, just on the screen how many different opportunities that we have to uh, advance the technology. So um, really excited about getting our first flight opportunities uh, late this year, early next year on some of these programs. And uh, very excited to be working with all of our customers to uh, advance linerless tanks, advance space exploration and uh, sustainable transportation. So hopefully uh, Matt is uh, set up. Uh, I, yeah, one of the other things to chat about is kind of our revenue growth um, over the last couple of years. So uh, started off slow. You can kind of uh, see on there, it's a little small that, uh, um, you know, back in 2000, what is that, 18, we were doing about $65,000 in revenue, uh, only moving a few tanks out. Thank you for making that large so I can actually read it. Uh, we've been seeing about uh, some significant growth. We actually had over 300% uh, revenue growth last year from 2020 to 2021. Uh, we've also closed uh, over 1.4 million in new uh, purchase orders um, just this quarter, mostly in the last uh, 10 or 15 days. So uh, we're, we're on track to have a really good year this year. Um, already, uh, we've closed about 3 million in sales last year. And we're already at uh, 1.4 million in new sales this year. So uh, very excited about what the rest of this year will bring and how many new uh, contracts we can bring on. But uh, very exciting growth and uh, hoping to see that kind of hockey stick uh, keep progressing over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. And it looks like uh, Matt's ready. So we'll kick it back over to him to check out the uh, testing area. Hey everyone! Uh, all right, we're ready to uh, to get this party started and uh, and get the test going. Um, we'll uh, we'll have uh, Shamim start the uh, start the test, and then we can uh, uh, answer any questions or um, you know just chat about what's going on with the test. Very cool. So let's uh, let's show up where Shamim is at and and talk through some of what he's looking at. I don't know if Shamim's on mute because I know we muted that for uh, some uh, feedback earlier. So you may need to uh, tell him to <laughs> unmute that screen or we can just <laughs> talk over from our side. So uh, I can see right now that uh, at the very top of your screen, you can see um, 85 PSI. Um, I'm assuming we have either started the test or we are getting it prepping. But um, basically, you'll have a, a readout of the current pressure at the top of the screen. Um, this vessel, like Matt said, is for an uh, 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 updated resin system on our lunar lander program to advance our cryogenic technology. Actually, and, T, maybe it might be better to um, situate people to let them know what they're looking at, because I see the pressure building, but what is it building up? I, I believe we have a live feed of what's actually happening in the chamber. Yeah, uh, I think we should be able to cut to that, uh, hopefully. Okay, let's just pull that up. There it is. So we've got okay. four different uh, angles of this uh, cryogenic tank. Uh, we're testing right. so, this with... Go so ahead. Just, just before we go on to there, because um, I just saw this before we did the stream, but, but not everyone else did. So this is what's happening outside, you know, that area where we had the Wi-Fi cut out. So just outside that, there's... Um, what is it? It's a, it's a shipping container? It's a converted... Nice shipping shipping container, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we, we've we've uh, taken a 20 foot ISO shipping container. We've lined the insides with mining blast mats that are uh, intended just to, to uh, withstand TNT blasts, and uh, put up uh, tire walls on the front, back, and the ceiling. Um, we've had some pretty uh, pretty exciting explosions in here, up to 14,000 psi so far, and uh, we've never had anything escape. But we have had a couple of tanks go uh, turn into rockets. And so uh, you got to be, you got to put a lot of uh, padding in there to uh, to catch that. But uh, it's, uh, um, you know, 
kind of dirty, messy, but uh, it does the job. And uh, we have a lot of fun, uh, you know, making bets on when the tank's going to blow up and uh, and what's going <laughs> to happen. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun time when we do a burst test. Got yeah. it. So um, we're doing a burst test now, right? That's that's what that yes, earlier the, screen was showing. The it tank, started the tank should be uh, going. So you may want to have the uh, you may want to have the uh, chart up. Okay, so let's go quickly already. to the chart and then we'll, we'll check back in here because it's very interesting and I want to ask a bunch of questions. I'm sure people in the chat do too. Yeah, so you can see at the uh, top of the screen, we're at the, about almost 900 uh, PSI. Um, you'll have a little bit of fluctuation as the uh, pump uh, uh, cuts in and out, uh, pressurizing the tank. So you'll sign it, kind of see it jump up and drop down a little bit. Uh, that's just uh, pressure reading and uh, gaps in the uh, system. But uh, what's important is that you see that uh, graph line going uh, up and to the right until it ultimately uh, drops down. Um, and I think one of the other things that would be beneficial if uh, we want to cut back to the uh, tanks is we can talk about the, uh, some of the ways they fail and uh, ideally how they should fail and ways that you don't want them to fail. And I'll let uh, Matt kind of uh, chime in to provide some details on that. Yeah, so uh, typically... Uh, According to most standards, there is a certain method of failure. Um, so if your dome blows off and turns into a rocket, it's not a successful pass. The tank has to uh, burst axially along the sidewall of the tank, which is the, uh, the most um, dispersed uh, way of letting out the energy uh, of the explosion. And so it has to blow like that. Um, in order for it to be considered a, a passing test. Uh, additionally, some tests will go up to the burst pressure. You'll hold it for five minutes to let it stabilize, and that's, that's uh, kind of your, your pass. And then you'll continue on and see what the ultimate burst is. So usually there's some margin on top of the uh, burst to, uh, just to make sure that uh, you know, there's a little extra strength in there in case uh, weird things happen. But um, mm -hmm. That, that's basically what happens with a burst. And uh, we do this test to ensure that uh, it can handle the maximum load that the tank will see um, uh, multiplied by either 1.5, uh, sometimes up to three. And even in some of the infrastructure applications, they'll have a six time safety factor. So a uh, mm -hmm. wide range of kind of uh, testing uh, parameters there. Very interesting. So from the, the, the comments, I can see that we have some very technical people online. So we'll cut to questions in just in just a sec, but Tate, you were holding yeah. hey up. Guys, don't, don't you want to have the, don't you want to have the, uh, screen up showing what's going on on the, yeah, the let's cut to console. that real quick. Let's cut to that real quick. And Tate, your, your water bottle, you were, you were talking about it, it splitting axially in layman's terms, that's a straight line down the middle, correct? Yes, that's this, how this might be uh, easier. So yeah, if you're a uh, cylinder section, you want it to split down here, not anywhere on the dome ends. As Matt mentioned, it'll, if you have a dome failure, you'll end up with a rocket. So uh, ultimately you want it to split right down the center. Okay, awesome. So Chris is asking, what is it being pressured with? Andre is also asking, what is the fluid used in the, te in the test? So is the, it, it's, it's, it's water. Different. We're using water right now. You can use uh, like other fluids. Uh, I think uh, what the best view right now would be is the side-by-side -side of the test console and the screen. We're getting pretty high pressure. We need to switch over there if we want to okay. see it blow. Great, good point. So at what pressure is this tank expected to blow? The previous generation uh, models did about 3,200 PSI. The uh, design pressure is 2,000, so that's our minimum burst that we can have. Uh, so we're beyond yeah. that now. Uh, we expect it to blow probably between 3,000 and 3,500. Okay, all right, all right. So we'll keep doing updates on screen on what pressure we're at. We, we can't unfortunately show both screens side by side, but we're at 2,500, so getting close. This is this is happening pretty quickly. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, so a uh, comment on the uh, fluid side too. Uh, we do test with hydro, uh, with water, so that's why it's a hydrostatic test. The uh, reason for this is because if we were to test with gases, the energy is uh, significantly higher. So we're talking about 60 times the energy release if we were to use a uh, gas versus water. So um, one of the nice things is we can contain this in the shipping container with uh, these uh, tires and blast mats, but if it was a... Uh, new, uh, I'm sorry, a pneumatic or a gaseous uh, test, uh, it would be significantly more destruction, de uh, destructive if there was a failure. Yeah, typically it's about 60 times the uh, energy. So uh, if it was gas, it would be like a 
like a TNT explosion. And uh, you do measure these explosions in kilograms of TNT. All right, we're getting uh, we're getting up there. Uh, we're at uh, 2750 in climbing. Uh, okay. You may or may not be able to tell, but the tank is a little fatter than it was uh, when we started the test. Uh, typically, these tanks will uh, grow about 1% axially uh, along the axis and then 2% or yeah, no, apologies. 2% axially, 1% radially. So around the girth of it, it'll grow about 1%. Um, and then once it goes beyond that 1%, boom. Oh my gosh. There it goes. Wow. Okay, okay, okay. So Matt, you want to talk about the uh, failure of uh, the tank and uh, are you heading out yeah. there? Yeah, so um, it looks like uh, we did technically have a successful failure. You can see it kind of unzipped along the, uh, along the, the uh, cylinder wall. Um, you know, when these things do burst, it's, um, the, the domes do come off sometimes when it does rupture like that because of how the fibers are aligned. So uh, this, this did come out as a, as, a, uh, as a successful burst. I didn't see what the uh, max pressure was, but uh, I think we we're uh, close to that 3,000 mark. Uh, we'll go out there and see if we can uh, maintain our connection and uh, check it out in person. Yeah, so it looks like we had a failure around 3,054 PSI. Um, and Matt, if I'm not mistaken, this is kind of what we call a, a diamond failure, right? Or a, uh, cause you have the, uh, triangular. Yeah. Screen. So you get, uh, you get the line from the cylinder, it goes up and then it hits fibers that were going horizontal or, uh, going, uh, uh, helical patterns around it. So it hit that and then it basically splits, uh, along those fibers. Are you ready to open the door? Yeah. Fits. Yeah, so that's kind of funny. Someone just uh, mentioned that the uh, kind of reminded them of popping over a uh, Pillsbury uh, uh, dough canister. So that's kind of yeah, uh, it is. It is. Uh, it is kind of like that on a on a much higher level. So that's kind of funny. Are you guys still hearing me? All right. Yep. Yeah, we got you loud and clear. So what was the forklift doing? Just out of curiosity. Uh, so we we keep the forklift up against the doors just because of how much wear and tear we have on the doors to uh, keep any yeah. uh, blast from uh, blowing those out. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and what do you use to insulate this space? I see a bunch of tires. Is there anything else? Yeah. So inside of the uh, tires are uh, sandbags. And so this is just to create some additional weight and uh, structure to uh, resist against. So uh, we've had tanks go in every single direction during failure. Uh, that's one of the reasons we do this. And uh, hopefully Aaron will be able to get a shot of the uh, roof um, that I previously mentioned uh, um, during our uh, uh, sorry, previous uh, tour of this, but uh, basically uh, we've had tanks go airborne. That's why we have uh, tires on the uh, roof as well. So, so you guys can see in here, uh, we got a close up of the tank. Um, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good burst. Uh, looks like all of our cameras survived. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, this is what happens. Um, so it's wet, it's messy, it's somewhat hazardous, but uh, it's a, uh, that's what you got to do. So yeah, that's a really mm -hmm. good tank burst. Um, so we have a question from James. I feel like this is probably the best time to ask this. Why is Infinite Composites blowing up a pressure tank? Just you know, succinctly, what what information, what value do you get from this, and then where do you go from here? Yeah, this is how we validate our design burst pressure. So the upper limit of what the kind of load and what kind of pressure the tank can handle. Um, so in order to do that you have to test it to failure. So uh, basically this just gives us design validation. And uh, this tells us if we hit our safety factors and hit our design margins, and this says, yeah, this design is ready to go. Um, this one actually will have six times safety factor uh, for a uh, 500 PSI operating pressure at uh, cryogenic uh, temperatures. So okay. um, it's, it's design verification. Yeah, so this is a part of qualification testing typically for any uh, any program out there. Uh, this is a minimum, uh, basically, structural validation. Okay. Um, quick question. Do the neighbors complain at all? Um, we typically do the uh, tests uh, after hours. We have a machine shop on either side of us. Um, so when you get to some of the higher pressures up above 10,000 PSI, it can be a little bit disruptive. Um, 
but we haven't had any neighbors complain. We did do a uh, 15,000 PSI burst test uh, one time at around lunchtime, and our across the street neighbors uh, came out and were looking around. It uh, definitely shakes the earth. You can feel it, yeah. uh, and you can even like feel the kind of sound wave uh, uh, go when it when it bursts. Okay. So, wow, that's yeah. that's insane. Um, we have then, we have worked with the uh, hazmat compliance. We are sure that we are allowed to do this here. Um, okay, great. <laughs> um, so Leslie is asking, recycle the material. How do you dip, dispose of it? And then we had another question as well from um, Mark. How earth friendly are the composites? Um, once once the uh, polymers are cured, uh, they're basically inert. Um, you can. Essentially, uh, according to the um, uh, the vendors of the resins, basically once it's cured, you can dispose of it in any normal uh, waste container. Um, we do collect a lot of these because we like to do analysis after we blow them up. We cut them up into sections, look at the cross sections, and see you know if we can determine anything from them. Um, but um, I mean, the waste is uh, it could be it can be recycled. There are a lot of groups working on recycling the carbon fibers. Uh, but for now, uh, we basically have to throw the uh, throw the blasted tanks away um, after a certain amount of time. Um, but uh, it is uh, one of our future goals to be able to recycle the um, the expired or uh, used carbon fibers into other parts that we can use for jigs, fixtures, uh, even for our interfaces that uh, we thread valves and stuff into. Really interesting stuff. I just um, want to quickly shout out and thank whoever just made that live investment. So I just wanted to uh, throw that thank out. Thank you. We appreciate your help. And uh, if we get enough uh, traction here, we'll do another one of these and we'll go up to a 15,000 PSI burst. That would be really cool. And uh, so, you know, a couple of things, uh, the the inside view of the oven that goes up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. 500. No, 500. Oh, right. Sorry. I am mistaken. 500. <laughs> uh, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty hot already. So that we will be able to see on your guys's and our guy and Space Ventures social media, right? So um, sure. definitely check that out afterwards. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to make updates there. Um, yeah, uh, Jivika, you mind if I just jump in on some of these uh, questions uh, popping Not in? Not at all. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, so Chris, uh, on the, uh, the variance of uh, ultimate yield strength on tanks, um, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is just make sure we're hitting the, uh, the minimum burst. Um, I would say the variance on that is, what, maybe 2 or 3%, Matt, in terms of what we get on a, a consistent burst from uh, one tank to uh, the next? Yeah, it, it's typically plus or minus 5%. Usually it's tighter, but uh, it's usually around plus or minus 5%. Um, the ultimate yield strength is uh, primarily driven by the fiber, though. The variance would come from uh, the resin uh, interface with the fibers. So it's in the fibers itself, it's very consistent. Um, but uh, once you have the resin, that's where you have uh, some variability. So um, it can change your, your ultimate yield strength um significantly oh okay yeah brandon um brandon has a question that i want to get to so he's asking what are you using this raise for that's a great one what are, sorry what's, what's the raise for yeah uh yeah so the raise is to uh, bring in some additional non-destructive testing equipment uh which will allow us to um basically analyze the tanks uh without destroying them so we can do some of the similar kind of get some of the similar data uh, about the uh, consistency of the tanks without doing any destructive testing. So we can do that, send it out, and it'll be basically a um, unused tank. Um, so that's one of the major components. We're also uh, looking to hire some additional salespeople uh, and some additional engineers so that we can uh, take in more projects and execute more projects simultaneously and, uh, and uh, grow the company as fast as possible. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are uh, hoping to get a triple unit winder with these funds. So that would allow us to do three tanks at the same time stacked up on top of each other. Um, and that's really what we need to uh, to go into full production mode. Wonderful. So we are coming up again, 60 minutes. But we're going to try to keep it to 60 minutes for today. But again, if you have questions, just leave them in the comments. 
Also, again, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd encourage you to go back to the Space Ventures website, watch this live on the Infinite Composites Raise page, because again, we have a discussion tab where you'll be able to ask questions directly. And then Matt and Tate, there's not really that much separation. We're just a facilitating platform. Whatever questions you ask there, they'll be able to respond as well. So if we didn't get to your question, it's not that we're really picking and choosing. It's just in the order that we see them come in. So if you have other questions, please you know share them with us and we'll respond to them afterwards as well. So um, I just want to quickly kind of shout out um, the Infinite Composites blog as well. There's a lot of good information on um, IC's site. What I personally like is you guys also highlight your team members, right? And, and you have a little bit of information on, on who the face is really behind the team. Uh, so I'd encourage you, if you want more information, uh, like Bert, thank you for thanking us for the details and demo and, and thanks for your investment. Obviously, that's a great opportunity and, and way for you guys to, to learn more as well. Yeah, let, let me just give a, a shout out to uh, our uh, one of our employees who had his uh, one year anniversary uh, just recently. This is uh, Mitch Davis, one of our technicians. He basically makes these things uh, that we blow up. So uh, you can thank him for all his hard work that we just destroyed over here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we are just about to wrap up. Let me just go do a couple of closing remarks and then Matt and Tate, I'll pass over to you and then we will get everyone out of here in uh, 60 minutes. So thank you again for your questions. Um, as a reminder, Infinite Composites raise is closing very very soon it's less than 20 days so t minus 20 and and counting and closing really uh less than that so uh, this is almost your last chance to invest hopefully this demonstration the test the tour was really informative and and obviously i mean i'm i'm very excited to, to have seen what goes on in a pressure vessel testing facility oh and we see lots of investments coming in thank you so much for that um thanks everyone <laughs> yeah, Matt's, Matt's in the background there. So uh, that's kind of it for me. Just be sure to stay tuned on the Space Venture social uh, platforms as well as Infinite Composites social platforms. We'll be posting some clips and images and things we couldn't quite see because of the Wi-Fi uh, in, in today's stream afterwards. So um, thank you so much for your attention and your energy and your comments that really just, you know, makes makes our jobs a lot easier. Um, but yeah, that's that's it for me. And Matt Tate, it's, uh, it's all yours. Sure. So I want to thank everyone for uh, joining our live stream. Uh, thank you for everyone who's invested in our uh, crowdfunding campaign. Uh, I, I hope you are excited as we are to be going into all these different verticals, all these different vehicles. We have um, a very simple um, product, we're, you know, a, but a component in um, a lot of different vehicle systems. But we're in a lot of different vehicle systems, and uh, I'm super excited to be flying around in UAVs and hypersonic vehicles and next generation aircraft, spacecraft, launch vehicles, and soon to be lunar landers. It's it's a very exciting time to be at Infinite Composites, so a very exciting time to invest as well. So I hope you guys will join us in our campaign and invest in uh, Infinite Composites. Matt? Yeah, I appreciate everyone uh, taking time out of their busy day to uh, come and see uh, what we do here. I had a blast. I hope you had a blast too. And, uh, you know, thanks for all your investments. And uh, let's take this thing to the moon. Thank you. And hopefully we're kicking back. Energy storage is critical for the growing transportation industry. Infinite Composites is servicing multiple next generation vehicles for space, aviation, and transportation. Don't miss your opportunity to invest in the future of energy storage.